Hello, Kako. Good afternoon, everyone. Mahalo for coming out to our Compassionate Ko'olau Speaker Series and joining us today uh, to hear all about um, a fantastic journey on our side in Ko'olau Poko uh, from Herb Lee. So uh, before we begin, I'd like to give a little introduction about who we are. We are Compassionate Ko'olau Poko, a collaborative initiative founded by partners representing the Castle, Kailua, and Color Hill complexes of the Hawaii Department of Education, Wimmer Community College, and the Harold K.L. Castle Foundation. The Compassionate Kuala Poco Steering Committee began meeting during the fall of 2019 with a shared kuleana of helping Kuala Poco become trauma informed and better able to support youth and their families. Acknowledging that we occupy the Ko Hawaii Payana, the lands loss issue taken away from the indigenous people of Hawaii, we see the Aina as a sacred ancestor and continue to struggle to care for her. We are guided by the wisdom of the kuna, community leaders, families, and educators. Compassion Kuala Poko's mission is to foster a culture of caring. In other words, we aim to cultivate a flourishing, thriving Kuala Poko where the youth and their families are resilient and compassionate so they can take care of themselves and others. We accomplish this by serving, restoring, and honoring the ancestors' efforts to teach others the practices that help make this aina and people vibe by. This event is funded through a generous support to the Noble Foundation, Education First, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Le Aloha Foundation, all of whom we send a heartfelt mahalo. Thank I think I'm going to turn it to Gail. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Derek. And so now uh, I'm Gail Sola. I'm the uh, Educational Specialist for Compassionate Ko'ola Poco. And it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Herb Lee Jr. is a native Hawaiian and the president and chief executive officer of the Pacific American Foundation, a native Hawaiian serving nonprofit since 1993. Herb has led highly successful and innovative education and leadership projects that has benefited over 150 schools, trained over 6,000 teachers and formed over 200 community and industry partnerships over a 27 year period. In 1995, he founded the Waikolua Fish Pond Preservation Society to protect and steward our 400-year-old ancient Hawaiian fish pond, one of the few remaining in the 21st century. In 2011, he received numerous awards, including the Historic Hawaii Foundation's highest preservation award for the work at the Waikolua Local Fish Pond, the Hawaii Maoli and the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs, Kamana Oke Kanaka, the Spirit of the Hawaiian Award, the Rotary Club of Honolulu's Peacemaker Award and the OO Award from the Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce. In 2014, he was one of 10 in the country to be awarded a Cesar Chavez Champion of Change Award by President Obama. Please join me in welcoming our very special Herb Lee Jr. Herb, it's all yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Gail. Thanks everybody for taking the time uh, to be on this talk. Um, you know, I, although I'm the storyteller today, it really is um, a story about all of us and about this wonderful place that we call home in Hawaii, specifically Ko'olau Poco. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by um, saying that, you know, um, quoting one of the kupuna, I've had so many you know, wonderful mentors in my life. And throughout my slideshow, you're gonna see a lot of uh, mahalos on my little slideshow because as I was going through this, um, you know, I really wanted to acknowledge, um, you know, all the people that helped me on this journey, including probably a, a lot of you that are on this call as well. Uh, but Auntie Malia Craver from uh, Queen Lilio Kalani Trust many years ago, um, you know, she helped us as we were mentoring kids. And she told me uh, one time that, you know, she pounded the table and she said, Herb, don't go looking over the four corners of the earth for the answer. The answer lies within you. And that all you have to do is figure out how to tap into that power of aloha. And that you would be lucky that in your lifetime, you can understand the more than 150 levels of meaning to aloha. So I wanted to kind of start off with that because this uh, Olelanoia Makahana Kaike that you see on our very first screen for that uh, is a depiction of Waikolo Loko. This is a, a January 2022 picture in the morning 
at Waikolo Loka. It was absolutely a breathtaking day. Makahana uh, Kaike means that knowledge comes from, you know, doing. Um, and it's, uh, so mahalo to America Vena Pukui, who actually coined that phrase um, many, many, many years ago. And the reason I, I talk about Auntie Malia Craver and that power of aloha is because when I think about compassionate koala poko, and I really am so grateful to have this opportunity to tell this story um, um, about really all of us in our community. Because when I think about compassion and I think about aloha, you know, it is one of the many levels of aloha to be able to have empathy, to be able to have compassion, to be able to have a passion for something that in that drives you to give back to the place in which you live. Uh, and that obviously, you know, is koala poko. So let's see. Uh, so uh, ovai in, in Hawaiian means, okay, before I keep talking, so some of you I may know, some of you uh, may, I may not know. So the ovai question is, okay, who are you? <laughs> who are you talking to me? Uh, and I think it's a very important question uh, as I share this story with you guys. Uh, and my, my response is, um, no ko'ola poko mayao. I am rooted in ko'ola poko. I'm born and raised uh, on the windward side. I grew up in Kaneohe. Um, I currently live in Kailua and I go to church in Waimanalo. And I've been doing that for, you know, basically all my life. So Ko'ala Poko District, which extends from Makapu'u all the way to Ka'ava, is really, you know, the realm of where I spent most of my life. And this is a, this is a picture I've had, you know, we live in the, in the century of 21st century of uh, Polynesian voyaging. And I, I chose this picture because you know, this is really about a journey, you know, forward for me and a, a transformative journey. And I thought that this picture really kind of uh, captured what I was feeling when I wanted to share with you, like who I am. And this is Hokulea. I, I have had an opportunity to sail on her a number of times, not really way out into the open ocean, uh, but within Hawaii. And it, you know, it always was a very intriguing experience for me. This next uh, uh, slide is uh, having to do, and I want to say mahalo to Pono Shim, you know, our beloved friend that just recently passed away. He was a big influence in my life. We were, you know, we sh often shared challenges and successes. Um, and he was uh, ohana to Auntie Pilahi Paki was another very important kapuna uh, for all of us and in our life. And through Pono's work, he influenced me and, you know, a few years ago, he came down to the pond and he shared with me this mana'o about e o hana ho. And he said, you know, hana, everybody knows hana as work and like makahana kaike, right? In the knowledge, in the work comes the knowledge. It's not just about the work. Ohana to him meant <clears throat> grace. The o was the family, which we know the word ohana, family. But it is really grace that renews the family again. That's what a ohana is. And I hope, I hope that this story that I share with you today in the context of Waikulu Loko and Ko'ola Poko will help to inspire you to uh, look within yourself, look within your community and your family and look, look at it in the spirit of uh, tapping into the, those depths of aloha, tapping into that grace that comes from a kua so that we can renew, um, you know, how we operate, how we pay attention to family on a day-to-day -day basis, especially during a pandemic time when, you know, it has kind of um, rattled us in ways that we never thought we would be rattled. These two pictures that I chose to represent my immediate family, this is my wife, she's sitting right here next to me right now. Thank you, hun, for being here. <laughs> and uh, this is my daughter, my daughter, Megan Shunping Helani Lee. Um, she was, we started the restoration of Waikulu Loko in 1995, the same year that my daughter, Megan, was born. So I always like to tease her or 
or maybe not teasing anymore because she's going to be 27, 27 years old in a few months, a few, few weeks. And I, you know, I like to tell her that, you know, she's one of the few children in Hawaii that actually grew up her whole life on an ancient Hawaiian fish pond. Um, and I'm very, very proud of her. So next. So uh, the story that I want to tell, uh, as I said before, is really a story about not a, not just about me. Uh, it's about all of us. And and looking back on it, when Gail said, "Oh, can you give me a title for what you want to share?" and I thought about it, and I go, "Well, I've used this before. Waikulu Local Ia: a Story of Place, People, and Innovation Through the Lens of the Local Ia." Um, but it really, looking back on it, you know. When I first walk on the, I, I grew up in Kaneohe, less than a mile from Waikoloa, and I never knew that Waikoloa existed until I was 40 years old, and that was 27 years ago. And the reason is because it was owned privately, and uh, so I happened to be at the right place at the right time when foreign investors bought the Bayview Golf Course and all of the land surrounding the old Bayview Golf Course that was owned by a Hawaiian family, the Ukalka family, and uh, these foreign investors came and wanted to expand the golf course into a championship golf course. This is in the late 80s, early 90s. And not knowing that, you know, Waikoloa was a cultural resource uh, and, you know, they didn't understand what, what that meant. They, they thought that they could actually build a, a, a golf hole in the middle of the fish pond. So make a long story short, you know, uh, we were able to... Um, educate them. Again, I was at the right place at the right time. And before the final approvals were given by the Honolulu City Council, we came to an agreement that we would, um, that I would start a nonprofit organization to take uh, responsibility to take care of the fish pond. And I got to tell you, 1995, you know, I really didn't know too much about fish ponds at all. But I knew when I first walked on that wall that you see there at the first Makaha, and in those days, it was totally surrounded by mangroves. I mean, it didn't even look like a fish pond. When I went and made my way through the mangrove and got to the first mapaha, I could hear the voice of my grandmother telling me that I needed to do something with this place. And that's the unexpected journey. And, and not knowing, you know, what was going to happen and now looking back on it, I'm so glad that it did happen because it totally, totally transformed my life. So uh, why, why fish ponds? And we gotta go back in history. So think about, you know, what is the importance of fish ponds in the, in the evolution of the Hawaiian people in Hawaii before contact? And so I came up, I found these quotes, you know, these are some of the very first uh, Western contact explorers of Vancouver, Menzies, and Mears. And, you know, when they came up on the islands of Hawaii way back in the late 1700s, they were just absolutely amazed at the level of cultivation and, and the agricultural and the natural resource land management to cultivate food in Hawaii, things that they have never seen anywhere else in the world. So that kind of gives you an idea that, you know, uh, and we've, we know this now, you know, in studying history, that uh, for a thousand years, you know, the Hawaiian people were basically had no contact with the outside world. And they developed probably one of the most sophisticated land management systems on the planet, which included uh, the local Kuapa, which has not been duplicated anywhere else in the world, which is what Waikolua is. She's a local Kuapa. So now if we look at a planet, and let's kind of just kind of put this in perspective, okay, before we, before I start talking about, um, <coughs> uh, specifically about Waikoloa Loco. So since that time, right, um, we know that, um, so that, that time between now and then, uh, in the 21st century, 90% of our food, 90% of our energy, 80% of our food, is basically comes from offshore. Uh, two thirds of all the fish we either eat or buy in the store does not even come from Hawaii anymore. Uh, so from being totally self-sufficient 
being in the most isolated landmass on the planet and being totally self-sufficient to being in this situation uh, to me is not good, it's not acceptable. And if anything should inspire us to begin to look back into the indigenous wisdom and figure out how do we rebalance? How do we, and not to say that we go back totally to how our ancestors did it, but to figure out what is that lokahi? What is that, what is that balance that we can have between uh, indigenous wisdom and contemporary knowledge? And how do we, how do we balance that out in terms of you know, food production and survivability in the 21st century and beyond? That's really what part of this story is about. So uh, when we look at uh, the ancient wisdom, the indigenous knowledge, if you look at that little chart, um, <clears throat> the introduction of Hawaiian fish ponds was a transformative event, in my opinion, for the Native Hawaiian people, because they went from being a hunter-gatherer going out into the open ocean and catching food for people that lived on, on the island to actually being able to farm fish using the natural resources of the area. And when you compare that with the natural food chain of nature, it has become, through Hawaiian observation over the years in the construction of these Hawaiian engineering feats called local ia or fish ponds, a hundred times more efficient than mother nature. Now that is absolutely amazing. So when I first ventured onto Waikalua Loco, you know, I, I really didn't understand any of this. Um, but 27 years later, I'm just totally, you know, enthralled and, in, and, and motivated to share, you know, this knowledge because uh, it still works today. And, um, and it is uh, absolutely amazing technology. So Waikalua Loco Fish Pond, um, you know, is, in 2011, I think 2010, Honolulu Magazine uh, published an article that um, listed Waikoloa local fish pond as one of the most endangered historic sites in the state because by then, uh, from 1995 to 2010, 15 years had passed by and had gone through already four different landowners that were constantly threatening us. We didn't we were restoring and trying to revitalize Waikoloa local fish pond, but we did not own the property. We did not own the land and they could have kicked us out any time. And all those agreements that were made with the city council way, you know, in 1995, basically, you know, people forgot about. And so we continued to do the work and we continued to restore the pond and we continued to build up, you know, community knowledge and community support more people came out to help us and the numbers just grew and grew and grew. And, um, and so if you look at uh, the sidebar over here, uh, we know now that, um, oops, let me go back. That, you know, the first ponds were built about 800 years ago. Waikoloa is 400 years old. Uh, there were nearly 500 of these ponds that were built in the major Hawaiian islands. And as we, stand here today, there are less than 10% of them left. All of them, 90% of them have been wiped out. Um, I believe um, that these ponds hold the key to helping us to restock the nearshore fisheries in Hawaii again. And we've basically fished ourselves out. Uh, so I'm talking about the nearshore fisheries within the three mile limit of all of the Hawaiian islands. The largest ponds were uh, incredibly, uh, Kauai Nui and Hua Pa, which is known, we know today as Hawaii Kai, and they were the largest. Uh, Kauai Nui is somewhere between five and 900 acres. Hua Pa was about four or 500 acres in size. Waikalua is only about 11 acres. So I always consider Waikalua a baby pond in comparison to some of the others. The largest remaining pond in Kaneohe Bay is Moli'i, which is owned by uh, the Morgan family and uh, Kualoa Ranch. It's about 125 acres. We have about 12 ponds remaining in Kaneohe Bay, which is probably one of the, you know, the most in any part of the islands, you know, the major Hawaiian islands where there are ponds remaining. And it's that simply because it rains on our side. And these ponds were built uh, so that there was always fresh water coming from the mountain 
flowing through the pond and into you know the ocean or the bay in this case. <clears throat> so very important. Um, and as I said before, the local cool pa we know now from scientists that this style of engineering was not duplicated anywhere else in the world, which is really amazing to me. Again, powers of observation. So these are some photographs, 1928 and 2000, of what Waikalua looks like. I don't know if you can see. So 1928, all of this was already converted to rice fields above the pond. Um, and this is, and prior to that was all tallow fields because there was, there's a lot of water running both underground and through this area, which is kind of like a floodway now. If you look at the 2000 photo, the city, County of Honolulu built the Kaniwe sewage treatment plant in the early 60s, which also has been uh, a major threat over the years um, in terms of pollution, even though we weren't growing anything in Waikalua at the time. Uh, there's been tremendous amounts of spills, sewage spills in both the two streams, Kava, which is here, and we can see my cursor, and then Kaneohe stream or Kamuali'i stream which empties out all of the fresh water that falls in the Kaneohe Ohupua into the bay right here. And then this little clump here is uh, the second pond that we own that we haven't even cut into. It's about two acres in size. And it abuts uh, Kokokahi YWCA right here. So <clears throat> one of the fabulous things that we I never thought was going to happen as we were restoring the pond, we were about the third year into the restoration of the pond. So this is like 1998. And I get a call from a teacher from Castle High School. Her name was Sheila Cyberon. She's a, she was teaching 11 and 12th graders at Castle High. Um, and in those days, you know, they, they were, they were the challenging kids. They were, they call them at risk kids. There were 15 of them that, you know, were not necessary. She had them because she was trying to teach them science. And she called me and she said, Hey, I saw that little article in the paper asking for volunteers to come out and help restore the fish pond. And I have these kids with me and can I bring them down to the fish pond and maybe teach them science in a different way because I'm not reaching them in the classroom. And we said, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I have some friends with the University of Hawaii, Dr. Clyde Tamaru and others, you know, that can help, you know, with the education part. Um, and, uh, and I thought, wow, you know, maybe we can get some labor <laughs> from these young people helping us, you know, to restore the pond. And uh, they came down to the pond, I remember the very first day, and they did not want to be there. They said, wow, miss, you know, what, what, what are we doing here? They came all dressed up with the gold chains and all kinds of stuff, nice clothes, not realizing that, you know, they were going to get dirty uh, at the fish pond. And uh, so anyway, make a long story short, nine months later, we saw this amazing transformation in these kids where they not only became inspired learners and they learned science in the context of Hawaiian fish ponds, but they became the teachers. And, uh, and so we asked ourselves three questions and I think I have it someplace here. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Doesn't know how to work a PowerPoint. He's using. And, can you see that? Okay. So um, we asked ourselves, so I, I asked those kids at the very beginning, where does food come from? And guess what the answer was? Store. From the store, right, from the store. And I go, wow, we have, we have a long ways to go, you know, that, and I, as I reflected on it, I thought, wow, you know, we've really lost the connection to Aina and knowing where food comes from. And we've gotten so dependent on imported food and going to the store and things like that. And, you know, so we asked ourselves three questions. You know, can we duplicate this transformation that we saw in these kids? Can we reach more students? And imagine if, you know, we could actually begin to give them this kind of learning experience when they were like in kindergarten. And, you know, imagine what, you know, by the time they became high school students, what they would be like what they would be aware of. Um, and by the way, this picture with this gentleman, young gentleman throwing the net into the pond, this is one of the original students from Sheila Cyborn's class uh, from Castle High School um, that, I was, that I'm talking about that became the teacher. 
And I remember that, you know, uh, Lieutenant Governor at the time was Maisie Hirono. She had a, this grant program and um, she wanted to come down. And these kids, I didn't say a word. These kids taught her everything, including teaching her how to throw a net in the fish pond, which I thought was absolutely amazing. Uh, that's me on the bottom. You can kind of see the date. I think it's like, I forget, 1998 or something like that teaching our very, our very first uh, teaching board uh, about fish ponds. And that's when I was like, I think 50 pounds lighter. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay, so now in 1999, Advertiser did this article, Restored Fish Pond, now a learning center. Now you gotta remember that in those days, 1999, you know, there wasn't any curriculum that taught science, social study, language arts, mathematics, in the context of fish ponds. Um, and so as a result of that transformative experience with the kids, I went on, um, I, I tried to teach myself how to write grants. And I went to every grant writing workshop and for three years, you know, I wrote grants and I didn't win anything. Then I partnered with the Pacific American Foundation. I didn't know who they were. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, they had some connections. They helped me write this grant to the U.S. Department of Education under the Native Hawaiian Education Act, which I never knew anything about. And all of a sudden, I had $1.1 million to put together a team of people that could construct, um, what, in those days, what we called a culture-based education curriculum in the context of an ancient Hawaiian fish pond. And we called it Kaia Loko, which I go back to the previous slide. Um, which was this project right here, local, the call of the pond. And it was our very first effort to develop curriculum for grades four to 12. And then that followed with Aloha Aina, which was also grades three all the way to 12 that taught about the Ahupua. And because out of the Kaihe local uh, curriculum, the kids were asking, well, how does a fish pond fit into the Ahupua, you know, the land management system? From the mountain to the sea which goes back to the original land management system that i talked about when those first western explorers came to the islands in the 1700s so we developed that and we, we've been able to adapt both of these curriculum in many profound ways throughout all of the neighbor islands and that's how we eventually got to you know uh, reaching out to 150 schools and all these teachers that we've been able to train then we've developed other titles as well we use the same expertise and the team of people that I hired, cultural practitioners, language specialists, Hawaiian artists, Brooke Parker did all of the artwork from day one for 20 years with us, including scientists. Um, and we co-developed master teachers and we co-developed all of this curriculum that has subsequently won you know, lots of awards and things like that. And, and hopefully inspired other people to develop you know, lesson plans in the context of um, you know, Hawaiian sites, including the Ahupua, Ahupua fish ponds. We were, we were invited to develop all of the education lesson plans for the island of Ko'olawe. We spent three years on island with uh, PBS and the Maui Department of Education developing some extraordinary lesson plans to help heal the island. And then we were able to, we were contracted by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to develop curriculum for all of the reefs in Hawaii I had an opportunity to go out to Midway before Midway Papahanao Mokokea became a national monument where there's a whole bunch of us that went out there to assess how we could develop educational programs around some of these models for the perpetuation and learning of uh, the Papahanao Mokokea uh, Marine Sanctuary Monument. And then finally uh, partnering with the Pacific Tsunami Museum we develop curriculum on tsunamis and sea level rise and global climate change and et cetera, et cetera. And it just, it one success led to other successes and, and we kept the team in place and it was absolutely an incredible, incredible experience. <clears throat> I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. Sorry about going back. So I, I present this picture because I think this is, um, this is a great picture. I've used some of this picture before. You know, if you think about it, we really haven't 
change how we educate our kids too much. This is like an old photograph from the 1900s. And if you look at the blackboard in the back there, somebody's teaching them how, how plantations work. But just look at the faces of the kids. And I want you to get, your, get that picture ingrained in your mind, because I'm going to show you some other pictures a little later on of what I feel they should look like when they're inspired learners. And it's not to say, you know, I'm not disparaging how we do things, but I'm just saying that, hey, you know, um, let's be a little bit more creative and innovative because I believe that we live in the greatest community classroom on the planet because of our weather. And we hardly get to take our kids out any time, you know, to go learn, you know, this in this great community classroom. So uh, these next uh, slides are going to show you now our journey at Waikolua Local and some of the, you know, the early um, supporters of us. Uh, and I want to say mahalo to Professor Hiroshi Kato and Floyd McCoy and, you know, many other professors. I'm going to show you some others later on. Woodward Community College was, you know, a huge partner from the very beginning, teaching us, you know, the ways of the pond. Uh, so you can see some of the critters that, that are coming out of the pond. And again, you know, think about this as a, you know, makahana ka ike, right? Come, learning by doing. Ohe pau ka ike ikahalaho okahi. All knowledge not learned in one school, right? Um, there are so many ways to enhance the learning and in the resources and in the place that we live called Hawaii. We live in the best place. So all I was trying to do is try to take advantage of that to the extent necessary and hopefully try to inspire other people along the way. I don't know if you guys remember this. I think this is an old Sun Press article in the 90s, uh, and it features some of, you know, really, really close and dear friends over the years. Some of them have passed away now. You know, Professor, uh, the Rotary Club of Kaneohe, which I'm still a member of, and they just all came down to the pond recently. Uh, Dr. Clyde Tomorrow, uh, Dr. Dave Krupp, Sheila Cyburn right there, and of course, Castle High School, you know, and we've, had, we've continued these relationships over these years, and it's just been absolutely phenomenal. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, Waikulu Local EA has now become the peak for our organization. So, what, I, what do I mean by that? Everything that we do centers around the Waikoloa local uh, in terms of not just the lesson plans and the culture-based curriculum that we've been able to develop, but we've also leveraged that to do mentoring program, leadership programs, uh, career planning and development programs, natural resource management program. We recently completed five years in uh, learning and partnering with the University of Hawaii Pre-STEM Academy, teaching the engineering design process and incorporating indigenous wisdom into the en engineering design process, the scientific inquiry process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all ways that have connected, you know, what we've learned at the pond to the mainstream education uh, opportunities and strategies. Um, and so it's been actually so wonderful. I want to say, a hollow to the Waikoloa Fish Pond Preservation Society that was the original nonprofit that we formed in 1995. A lot of the members were from Winwood Community College and the community that helped shepherd us until 2015, which is the year that we were able to buy Waikoloa Local Fish Pond. We now own it. We created another nonprofit called Pacific American Foundation Hawaii, Inc., uh, which is now the owner of Waikoloa Local. Um, so it is a pico for what I call what we call culture and place-based education. And again, as you as I go through some of these pictures, look at the faces of these kids uh, that I talked about. Uh, so again, just look at pictures. These are just some of the things that we're doing. Uh, taking out invasive uh, gorilla ogo, we call it, from the pond that you can see right here, and these kids pulling up mangrove, mangrove pods, uh, things like that. Next. 
Uh, see, these are things that, you know, when I was growing up, we never got to do. So we call this a pie pie activity. And this basically what they're doing is we have this big fishnet uh, about 300 feet long. We make a human line and we chase the fish into the net. Then we bring the net up and then we see what we caught and we learn, we learn about that. Uh, this is the Olelo no Eau that I, that I shared earlier, all knowledge not learned in one school. And what Kawai Kapu Hewitt also taught me was, uh, he, he turned me on to this Olelo no Eau that, you know, it is also about being humble in the knowledge uh, that you don't know everything and that, you know, don't, don't, be, don't be too boast, boastful about what you do or do not know but just always be open. And as Pono says, be empty, be empty so that your cup can be filled. And Derek mentioned, you know, the concept in Compassion Koala Poco regarding the concept of Ipo Vai Vai. And I interpret that as taking the Ipo. The Ipo is a metaphor for the student. The Vai Vai are all the riches that you put into the Ipo by way of knowledge, by way of things that, you know, people will experience in their lifetime that contribute to the vitality and growth of that student, of that family, family and that community. This is an example of the Gorilla Ogo. This is a, I wanna say that this is the impact of global climate change. We hear about it in the newspapers all the time, but I tell you, in, a, in our small corner of the world in Kaneohe Bay, we are feeling the impacts of this. So, you know, for about 20 years, I'd say, uh, we were taking out about a hundred tons of this gorilla ogo, which is invasive, it chokes out all of the native seaweed. And we we're taking it out and giving it to uh, taro farmers in the Windward District. You know, they shoot it down with uh, fresh water and then they throw it into the taro patch for a nitrogen fix. But, um, and in 2016, you know, we had experienced a couple of changes in the, in the climate. Uh, the temperature of the ocean went up one degree centigrade. Uh, we, we've experienced the king tides for the very first time. And all of a sudden, within a period of three months, the gorilla ogo disappeared from our pond. Uh, so we, we, the way I refer to it is that we experienced a mini extinction event in our own little pond. And so, which was not necessarily a bad thing. So what we decided to do was to, you know, focus on trying to um, grow native limu in our pond again because it didn't have this competitor, you know, in the pond anymore. And we, in, in about two years, we figured out that limu manuel grows really, really well in our environment. And so we've been on the, um, this, this journey to try to grow as much limu manuel as possible. Um, let's see. So, this is, um, um, these, so again, look at the faces of these older kids. And, you know, this is not easy work, lifting stones and rebuilding walls and things like that, removing invasive mangrove. But this picture I, I wanna plant in your, in your mind, you know, the idea that we do live in the greatest community classroom on the planet. So ask yourself, what does your community school look like? And there is a international and national phenomenon that is happening regarding this concept of community schools and really looking at how schools can utilize the resources of their own communities to enhance learning, just like how I'm describing with you. Doesn't have to be only in the context of fish ponds, could be anywhere could be in your backyard because you wanna build a mala or a garden to grow food. It could be anything. The fact is, Hawaii, we live in the greatest, I don't know how many times I'm gonna say this, we do live in the greatest community classroom on the planet. And we need in the next generation to take more advantage of inspiring our kids to be the best that they can be. It's not easy work, but there are way more nonprofit organizations and other entities that are doing these things that can help and assist, you know, the institution of public education, private education, charter schools, home schools. You know, we've seen them all over the 27 years. And uh, it's been absolutely a wonderful experience and an honor uh, to learn and grow with them. So this is just to acknowledge, mahalo to our 
teachers. They have been huge, I mean, huge inspirations to us. We are so honored and appreciate what teachers do um, in the classroom. And if you think about this pandemic time, please give your teachers a hug because they have been incredible warriors in these last two years going through all of these machinations with virtual learning. And, you know, they, they never, a lot, of, a lot of people were not ready for it, uh, let alone the students, you know. And so as we're sort of beginning to transition back, it is still, you know, um, there's still many, many gaps to learning. But again, you know, over the years that we've been able to train teachers in our various curriculums, uh, it has been absolutely wonderful. So I really believe, you know, um, you know, you, you, you learn from each other and you give uh, and you give back as well. So as a result of bringing all of these kids down to the fish pond, what there was a phenomenon that also happened. They would go back home and they would tell their parents, wow, we just had this you know, fantastic experience at this fish pond in Kaneohe Bay. And, you know, I don't know if you, if you guys are from Kaneohe or not, but, you know, not, what I'm told is that 90% of the people that live in Kaneohe or around the bay never get into the bay, never go to the bay. And like me, I was 40 years old until I actually realized that Waikoloa Loco even existed, right, in, in my backyard. So we created these, what we call La Ohano Community Work Days. And this really was an opportunity for the students that were coming down to learn math, science, and all that stuff, give back, steward the pond, work with, work with us, to bring their parents down uh, and to experience what they were experiencing and allow the kids, the children, to school their parents about what an ancient Hawaiian fish pond was about. And we were absolutely amazed at what happened. And I'm going to show you next what happened. <clears throat> All these people started coming out to our work days. And we've been doing this now. We started this in 2000, and we've been doing this for 22 years. We only hold five of these work days a year. Um, and they still come out in droves to come and help us. And that's how we got over the 100,000 mark, you know, in less than 20 years to uh, help steward the pond. It was just an incredible experience. And now people come from all over, not just the Koala Poco region. They come from all over the, the island, all over the state. They come from places like Egypt and Asia and all over the place. Uh, and they come on a regular basis, believe it or not. It is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and we've been, we've been able to meet just incredible people that have you know, inspired us even more you know, to persevere through all of the challenges that we've faced over the years. And we continue, continue to do that. We just had Kaneohe Elementary School come down last Saturday. I think there were like over 150 of them. All of their fourth graders came to use. Thank you, Derek Minakami, for allowing your fourth graders to come and spend a whole day, a whole class day at the fish pond. And then uh, this past Saturday was an opportunity for them to bring their parents so that they could teach their parents what they learned in the last school year in the context of the pond and also show off some of their new uh, technology in terms of how to catch crabs in the 21st century using 21st century materials. It was so much fun. Getting close to the end, you guys. So um, there is gonna be time for question and answer. So I'm not gonna go too much longer. I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that it's so much information, uh, but I hope um, you know that you guys can hang in there a little bit more. This, uh, you know, Estria Foundation, I, I love Estria. Uh, and, you know, he's located at Kaneohe Elementary now. Um, and, you know, they've been doing murals all over town. And so mahalo, this is a mahalo to Pu'ohala and Kaneohe Elementary Schools and Estria Foundation for, and the, for, for doing this mural. And it occurred from 12 o'clock in the afternoon to nine o'clock at night. And the, the, the process that Estria goes through to engage students and how they conceive of what's going to be painted is absolutely incredible to me. You know, he engages them in dialogue, they have to talk about things, and then they just start throwing all kinds of different paints on the wall. 
And then, you know, a few hours later, it turns into something magical like this. So uh, these are some of the predominant, you know, look uh, fish in, in our pond, a hole hole, the mullet, um, o, o, o eel, and of course the barracuda. And then we have uh, the Io, the Io, the Hawaiian stilt started coming back to the pond about 10 years ago. And, you know, that to me, that's a sign. Then we have the limu in the middle, uh, which is what we're trying to grow, limu manuea. <clears throat> so moving on, moving on, moving on. Um, so this real quickly is uh, in 20, in 207, we were the superintendent of education at the time called a whole bunch of us, all native Hawaiian educators, about 250 of us. And we met over a two and a half year period. And the consequence of this, uh, many things came out of that. But one of the consequences that I like to always showcase is, you know, based on what we learn is keep coming up with this model of culture and culture-based education in Hawaii. So the Hamana, the student is on the bottom of the triangle and we expose them to the content, the context, which is the fish pond. And the idea is to inspire the learner, have the learner live what they're learning and eventually to be able to teach it and then go all the way up to the apex of the triangle. And then the Lao is sort of the spiritual realm that kind of holds all of this together. And I've taken this picture which came to me in a dream and it resonated with all of my colleagues. I took this, I took this Manao <clears throat> all over to Aotearoa, New Zealand, to Alaska, to uh, you know, indigenous Native Americans, you know, to share this Manao. And uh, it resonated, you know, all across uh, indigenous with indigenous people. So we knew that we were onto something. So very, I'm a visual learner, so I need to really. I wanted to kind of put something on paper that people could, you know, figure out in like 10 seconds. The other consequence is that, um, oops, in 2015, uh, Cheryl Kahane Lupe Nui, um, who, was, who was a member of the Board of Education, uh, assembled a whole bunch of us. And the idea was to uh, create some kind of a framework that was culture based that we could infuse into the public education system so that when you walked into any classroom that you would know that you're walking into a classroom that's in Hawaii and not someplace else. And we went all over the planet looking for other models and looking talking to other indigenous people and then, you know, uh, there was a whole there was about 12 of us. Uh, um, the complex superintendent um, uh, from, uh, from the Windward side and myself served on this committee. And it was, you know, this one now came, came about uh, collectively by all of us. And now it's been adopted by the Department of Education. And it really is to try to, you know, infuse some of these ideas about what makes Hawaii unique as that community classroom. So if you haven't, you know, seen it, you know, you can Google it. It's called Naho Pena'a'o. We call it Ha or breath. And it spells out the word breath. Sense of belonging, responsibility, excellence, aloha, total well-being in Hawaii. And I think in this pandemic time, more than ever, we need to ground ourselves in some of these values and principles as we continue to forge ahead, you know, with uh, learning. Uh, so this is sort of like a summary. Oops, sorry about that a summary of you know what we've done over the last 27 years now and almost getting to the end let's see oops oh some of our valued partners i just want to do a shout out um, to Windward community college currently chancellor artist Essenberg. these are incredible leaders in our community everybody and to all of the Windward Community College staff and students, they have been tremendous partners. We've learned a lot from them. They've, they've counseled us, guided us, you know, in many, many different ways. And we couldn't have been on this journey without them at all. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have enough time and space to acknowledge everybody, but some of these few I really wanted to acknowledge uh, because they have played key roles. Coconut Island Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology is another huge one. Joanne Leong and now Eleanor Sterling, 
um, Phil Helfridge before that, uh, you know, some incredible people that we take our kids, you know, to this learning opportunity every weekend, Derek Isabel and, and uh, from PATH and others, Leon Weaver, <clears throat> Jayton Galerio, they all take kids over here every Sunday and they go learn and they've been doing that for years. It's just been really incredible places uh, for kids that really want to learn and really go deeper, you know, to expose them to. The other thing, the other one is Smithsonian Institute. We partnered with them 2014, made a 30 year commitment. And this is to focus on, you know, gathering data and working with students and the, some of the top scientists in the world uh, to help figure out what's going on with global climate change. And Kaneohe Bay and our pond is one of those seven or eight, what they call marine geo or um, global earth observatories on the planet that uh, scientists, you know, will collect data for the next 30 years to help inform them about global climate, global uh, climate change. And then uh, just three weeks ago, partnership with the University of Hawaii Sea Grant, we, um, uh, Kai Fox and um, Danny and Andrea, all these people, Roz, everybody, we've, uh, we've we created this, what's called the Pua Boot Camp Project. And what it is, is we have now 26 of these thousand gallon tanks on property. And our goal over the next two years is to figure out how to grow food again using pond water. We've had, we've tried to grow fish and other things, you know, that were basically spawned in other places and tried to grow them in either tanks or in the pond. It never worked. They all pretty much died. So now we're uh, trying to spawn them here uh, at the pond using pond water. Uh, in different kinds of ways to screen them and filter them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I kind of think about it if, like the three bears, too warm, too, too hot, too cold. 26 different scenarios to try to uh, cull, um, um, grow limu and fish and sea cucumbers and uh, native uh, oysters all together in one environment and see you know which formula works the best. So. Super excited about that, super opportunity to teach students at all grade levels. This is happening in our own backyard and not many people are doing this, but I think it's gonna be really important. We as an organization, Pacific American Foundation has designated food uh, production as our top focus program over the next 25 years. We wanna make a dent in reducing the amount of imports that we make uh, to the islands, and uh, and hope hopefully that you guys can help us do that. Uh, in the pandemic time, you know we had to go virtual as well. Mahalo to Derek and the Path Ohana for basically taking all of our curriculum, going into diving into the oceans, going and using our drones to develop these virtual learning you know strategies and programs. Um, to help, you know, in that transition, and uh, we're really happy and thankful that now we, we, we can we can begin to do things face to face again. But we've been empowered and enriched by you know the whole virtual learning experience, and have taken it to different levels. And this is this was also you know Smithsonian Institute also helped us do this as well. And uh, this little tidbit over here, in partnership with Hawaii Island Land Trust. City, City Council for, uh, approved, you know, a perpetual easement over Waikolo Loco. As I said, we had acquired Waikolo Loco in 2015. The perpetual easement that we got from the City Council in June of last year allows us now to, in perpetuity, protect the pond from ever, ever being developed in forever. So now we can really focus on, you know, propagation and learning and and being a site, you know, that can continue to give back and hopefully inspire a whole new generation of people and community going forward. And uh, so next 25 years, as I said, and I'm hoping that, you know, I, I really believe that, you know, maybe it's not it, as much as it is about growing food, what might even be more important that we never expected when we were started on this journey was to be able to impact student learning like you know, like how we've begun to. 
And I'm hoping that you know these gen these next generation of stewards will take it to an even higher level uh, than we did. So a couple of last quotes here. <clears throat> I'm a person of faith. And I tell you, when I started this journey, my faith wasn't that strong. But I tell you, uh, with all of the trials and tribulations that we've gone through, uh, it's been strengthened immensely. Uh, so I share this. Um, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. And so this is a depiction of the makaha, the gate that allows the babies to come into the pond. They smell the fresh water, they grow in the pond, and they cannot get back out. And the gate also keeps out the predators, like the barracuda and things like that. So you can kind of take that and use that as a metaphor for your life. Um, and uh, this other one that I want to share also. Um, let's see, I can't see that. Oh. Hold on. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance finishes his work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking in anything. This is from James 1. And so this picture was taken January 15, 20, 2022. I had five kahu do a blessing for our next 25 years. And they each took a meridian, north, south, east, west. And I did the final one. Uh, so I just want to mahalo nui, all of the kahu from Kuala Poko that helped us do that. And we're on our journey ahead. So this is this is my second to the last slide. You know, what we've been taught by our kupuna is leave it better than we found it. And I hope that I've been able to inspire you a little bit with my story which is really not a story about me, but it's a story about the resilience uh, and the perseverance and the dedication of our community and the people uh, in our community, which have given and, and so much you know, to us in this journey. Um, and so we, I started with this slide, Makahana Ka'iki, remember, and I end with this in Makahana Ka'pumai Ka'i, which means the from the work comes the blessings. And I really feel that in all of this work, uh, I have been blessed to be part of this and to be part of this journey going forward with all of you. And let our all of our families be renewed with the power that comes from aloha with the power of grace uh, going forward. So um, <clears throat> aloha, so I, 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 sum, I summarize everything that I share, the four steps that I've learned uh, in this journey. Aloha keakua, because the kids asked me, how do you aloha aina, uncle? And so, wow, that was, you know, I can talk about aina, but to talk about aloha and where that comes from, I really have to reflect deeply. And, you know, so that first step, you know, before you can really understand aloha aina is aloha keakua that comes from them. That aloha is in, 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 in dwelled in us. That's our aloha. Then we share that aloha with everybody. Aloha kikahi, kikahi. We always start with a circle at our fish pond, and then you can truly understand the importance of aloha aina, and not only about where food comes from, but how to be passionate about the places in which we live, because Koala Poco and our community is very special and very honored, and I thank you for your aloha uh, and for allowing me this uh, opportunity to share this story. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I'm sorry that it took so long um, but I hope it was helpful and meaningful to all of you. So I'm going to stop sharing. That's it for me, Gail. Herb, thank you so much for all the inspiration. Please, um, everyone, unmute yourself. Please feel free to ask questions. <laughs> I'm... I'm you can ask me about anything and I'll give you an anything honest answer. <laughs> hey Herb, this is Lonnie. Long Hi Lonnie. Um, yeah. My question is, what are the requirements for coming down to just visit and view the fish pond? There's no requirements, just come down. Okay. Um, probably the easiest, you know, we don't, 
we have people that are down there every day now. What we prefer is you can go online we at the www.path.org or just Google Pacific American Foundation and our website will be one of the first that comes up and then go to Waikoloo Local Fish Pond and you can sign up there or just email me or call me. I'll put my email in the chat for Hi. everyone. And uh, and even my my phone number, if you want. That's great. I live right up the street, so <laughs> I just want to make sure I can when I can come down. Yeah, we want people. You know, I I really believe that we are stewards passing in time. Yes, we may own it from a Western standpoint, but really, this is this was acquired with a community purpose. So you know, you come down, you give back it's part of your legacy just as much as it's part of mine. So I want people to have that sense of ownership in it because if they do, then hopefully they will malama it and have aloha for it, right? So that's our, that's, that's our thinking, that's our strategy. Uh, so, you know, we don't Herb. put any couple signs on our property because I don't want there to, for people to feel that you know, it's couple for them to not come in. Go ahead. Oh no. Yeah, Susan. Is it Susan? And then Hiyaka. yeah, but I think I think Hiaka was first. Go ahead, Hiaka. Okay. Hiaka, aloha. Aloha, Uncle Herb. Um, was just wondering if you have any cool summer programs happening for the Kiki. Yes, we do. You know, we're involved in the Lokahi and the Malama um, 21st century out of school programs or after school programs, where we're we're in 17 schools on the Winbridge side. And so we do have summer programs. Uh, we have one called Namaka Okaia, the Eyes of the Fish, which start on June, what is it, June 3rd, I think? No, June 5th, June 6th. Um, and therefore grades four to eight. And then there, so you can go to our website and, and uh, you know, I, th I still think that they're still signing up. Some of them are full already. Uh, we're doing things in partnership with Kaneohe Elementary School, with Castle High School, with Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, you know, all, all over the place. So yeah, come and contact us and, you know, we're, we, 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 we should have something for every, everybody, uh, but some of them might be filled up. I mean, wow, um, you know, the summer is going to be super, it's going to be super. I think it's going to be the best summer we've ever had. You know, especially coming out of this pandemic, everybody wants to go outside. And uh, so thank you for that. Sue? Her, um, at the beginning, you talked about when you discovered the fish pond and um, your grandmother spoke to you. Uh, can you talk yeah. a little bit more about that? I'm wondering what was going on in your life 27 years ago that kind of like make that happen? Oh. <laughs> Okay, well, my grandmother passed away in 1963. So she was, she had passed away over 30 years. But she was, in our family, she was really the last connection to our Hawaiian culture. She spoke Hawaiian, she did everything Hawaiian. And uh, I was, I was, I don't think I was even 10 years old yet. So, but I carry her with me everywhere I go. I still have fond memories. And I, I, to tell you the truth, I wasn't thinking about her. I was just trying to get through the mangrove to find <laughs> that first mapaha, you know? And I had to kind of weave my way through the whole thing. And then when I found it, I felt her presence really profoundly. And, and all I remember from walking back was, you need to do something with this place. That's all I remember. And I had no idea what that meant at the time. But, you know, at, later on, years later, you know, when I reflected and people asked me, you know, what motivated you? Because I, I remember going home and telling my wife, um, we're going to form an, I'm going to form a nonprofit organization. We're going to restore this fish pond. And she goes, are you crazy? You don't know nothing about fish ponds. <laughs> and, 
and I said, nope, we got we have to do this. Um, and I remember being in the city council offices with the chair and the, the planning director and the owner. And when we came up with this deal, you know, that because the city council wanted the, the owner to give it to the city, the mayor's office had called me right before the meeting saying, you know, we don't want the fish pond because if we take the fish pond and we don't take care of it, the Hawaiian community is going to be very upset with us. So I said, okay, I'll, the compromise is I'll, I'll do a nonprofit organization, but the caveat is the owner can only have one seat on it because I didn't want the owner to dominate. And I would go find community people to sit on the board to you know, help do this. And that's kind of like the rest is sort of history. Does that help? Yeah, does that help? Yeah, it does. So because you also mentioned about Pono saying, um, you know, about keeping the mind empty, right? And so in a sense, that's how you progress. You didn't know what you were doing, but it was empty. So it allowed you to pick up the important stuff that needed to be done. Yeah. You know, when, when he when he talks about the uh, Andy Pilahi Taki and he talks about the word ha'a ha'a, his interpretation is to be empty. So we all think ha'a ha'a means to be humble and to have humility, which it does. But it also means the deeper kauna is to be empty, meaning that you have to let all of this other stuff that you think you may know or, or life experiences that you think you may have, which may be good or bad or whatever. But if you go in with an empty mind, you know, uh, then you can fill yourself up more and be in the moment and absorb more knowledge, you know, of, of that time and place. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, so I, you know, we, we had lots of really uh, amazing discussions that continue to resonate with me. And as I said, you know, I've, I've I've had some amazing teachers and people come into my life, like like many of you, like you, Sue. <laughs> There's another. Oh, Chanel. Oh, aloha, Chanel. I see your hand up. Hi, her. Aloha. Um, I don't really have a question per se, but just a, a comment and a mahalo for you. So um, sure, sure. I love how you led and you close with uh, Makahana Kaike because I've had many discussions about that. And it's been at the forefront of my mind and. And when I think about that, it makes me think of um, makahana kaike for me is, is, is doing and leading with, with a purpose and um, an intention in mind. And if, it, and, if it, and if it's right, and that's the path that you're supposed to be on, you're often guided by your kupuna, by friends, by family, by mentors, by everything. Um, and then everything just clicks, you know? So I always enjoy moments when I can hear you speak. And this is the first time I've actually heard um, a summarization of your story and your history um, with White Kululoko. So I, I mahalo that, and I mahalo that sharing. And <laughs> I think for me, I don't know if you know this or not, but you've always been somebody that I have respected, and admired, and I think you have led a life of purpose, a life of service, you know, a life of what you were, um, were called to do. And I think it's really beautiful and really amazing. Um, so I just wanted to mahalo you and mahalo Raz and just mahalo the times that I have been able to work with you. Um, most of it has been through Ho'oluopio. Um, but yeah, but thank you. And thank you for opening with the makahana ka'ike and closing with it because everybody has purpose. Everybody has a mission. If we tune into ourselves and really listen to what our gifts are, and what our purpose is, we can make huge impacts in ways that we don't even know, you know? And so yeah. for your decades of, of what you've been doing and, you know, how you have worked with Waikua and your, and your surrounding communities, I think that is a true testament to that, you know? So, so mahalo nui for that. Thank you. Um, I wish I could give you a big hug right now, but I'm giving mm -hmm. you a hug right now. And thank you for all of your mana'o and for that aloha. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, 
when you tap into that resource and that power, I mean, anything is possible. And I think the point of this whole story today is that we live in a community that is absolutely amazing. And we have amazing people. So I believe that, you know, there are many stories to be told. And we need to hear these stories now, especially in this time when people are, you know, kind of trying to figure out, you know, what's going on going forward. Um, and I, I think it's important. Um, so that's, you know, I, I hope that it's, it's inspired you guys to also tell your stories as well. Anybody else? To, uh, let's see there. I don't see everybody. Any other hands? Or just unmute yourself and just speak. We don't have to follow that protocol. <laughs> oh, Hiyaka again. Aloha, just a quick one. I'm um, curious. Yeah. What were you doing for a living prior to getting involved with Waikalua Fish Pond? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, so I I, I I went 10 years in the public ed system, 10 years in the private school system. I graduated from UH Manoa and I thought that my career, my master's degree was in public administration. So I spent 10 years working in government in the legislative branch at state legislature. And then um, again, a, a very wonderful mentor. You know, I, I became, when Fancy Mink became chair of the city council, I, she asked me to come over. She was one of my professors in graduate school and I became her chief of staff at Honolulu City Council for four years, which was like going to college all over again. When I came out of that experience, I realized and I was looking for a job. She, you know, um, I decided to start my own business to do consulting as a community involvement specialist and take the knowledge of, because of what I learned from that experience is that a lot of people did not know how to navigate government, uh, whether it's to get a permit or, or whatever it is. Um, that you know, a lot of times government was or private sector people were imposing their will on communities, and the community really didn't have the power or the wherewithal to fight back or have a say or be informed, you know, to make the the playing field level. So, I I, I learned uh, as a result of that. Uh, community involvement experience. Um, I was trained in uh, public participation in Canada and uh, with the First Nation people. And then uh, I had some mentors, uh, including Likeke Palignawan, that helped me sort of morph uh, Ho'oponopono practices with public participation. And that's what led me to this whole thing. Because Bayview when the golf course was acquired by foreign interests, you know, it became very controversial. And I was brought in to try to help resolve the conflict in the community and not knowing that, you know, it would end up this way. And I continued to have that uh, consulting uh, business uh, 36 years later, but I don't do it uh, very often. Uh, because my, you know, all of this has transformed my life and my time, but I still enjoy doing it, you know, when I can, and if the situation presents itself, um, I do. So, man, that's kind of a long answer to that question, but that's what that's what led me to all of this, and you know, so that's the background that I have, and I still I, I still value all of that experience, uh, working in government, uh, you know. This is me, took me, you know, to Washington DC and I learned a lot from, from her, like you wouldn't believe about, you know, just how to deal with conflict, deal with the public, dealing with government, things like that. So I've had some really wonderful mentors in my life. Did that answer your question, Hiyaka? Yes, mahalo. Um, and by the way, Hiyaka. Yes. Go ahead. I'll be touching base with you in, in the near future because um, I need help with all of those things you just touched on. So mahalo for sharing. Yeah. And Hiyaka is also trying to uh, help restore uh, Ahui Manu, a hawker site up in Ahui Manu Valley. And I encourage you guys, if you, you know, if 
you guys can co cool her, you know, I kind of see myself in her, you know, many years ago, and she is very passionate, very talented young lady, and I, I'm hoping the best for her as well. So, good luck, Ki'iaka. You're so sweet. And I'm not going to go anywhere. Okay. Wow. Other question. Anything else, anybody? Interesting questions you guys got. <laughs> Bella. Hi, Bella. Hi, Uncle Herb. Nice Anna, to see is you. <laughs> Auntie Pua is on. Wow. Miki, ah, aloha. I'm, I'm just kind of scrolling and uh, seeing who's here. Aloha, you guys. Patrick. Aloha, Herb. Hey, Joe. Aloha. Kaonohi. Oh, Mahalo yeah, so aloha. much, Herb. Um, I think like many others on this call, this is the first time that many of us have been able to hear um, just the whole mo'olalo in one place, in one sitting, right? We get snippets of it here and there. And so it's really beautiful to be able to see the lay strung together in one piece. Um, so mahalo for sharing. You had mentioned earlier about just, you know, we haven't come that far from, from the way education has been happening in the 1900s, right? And, and how do we change that? Um, being somebody who's been working in the community for three decades and just doing all of this wonderful work and being able to inspire educators, what do you see as the biggest barriers to our formal education system in, in really embracing that kind of learning because the proof points are all there. And whenever, you know, the state wants to put its, its shining stars in front, they always go to community and, and, and highlight community experiences. Um, but what do you see as the barriers to really truly embracing it um, as a way of learning like it was in the days of our kupuna? Good question. And I, I think, um... You know, what I've learned, uh, you know, when Auntie Verley, uh, Verley and Malina Wright was alive, you know, we talked about this a lot. And we came up with this strategy, which is what I term like a hierarchical strategy. Um, because when we are doing those first teacher training sessions, you know, we learned and going to different islands. Oh, my goodness. We learned so much how to be humble and to be respectful. So I think the short answer is ho'ihi, is respect. That's the short answer. And the reason I say that is because, uh, again, it kind of goes back to the all knowledge not learned in one school, right? Being humble, right? Um, and because we, you know, the last thing we wanted to do is say, hey, we got this wonderful Waikalua local fish pond curriculum, and we're going to the big island, and we're going to teach you teachers how to malama your own fish pond in Kona, right? That is like that's a no-no right we have to go on almost like bended knee right and say you know this is our whole kupu you know this is something that we learn and if you can use any of this to help you on your journey you know that's a whole different thing so i think you know so between hawaiians there's this issue of ha -ha 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 that i just spoke about right being humble and being respectful at the same time and not wanting to trudge on anybody's you know path the other thing is i think if you look at the the makeup of you know the, of our teachers in the public ed system okay a lot of them do not have any kind of cultural hawaiian a sense of that hawaiian cultural experience maybe they've taken you know a course in hawaiian history or something but a lot of them out of respect do not feel qualified to be able to be the teacher, the kumu that we hope that they can be in teaching that aspect of the culture, let alone figuring out how to integrate, you know, the four core areas of math, science, all that stuff with culture, right? And I think that is, that is probably one of the biggest barriers. And so I think part of our journey is to you know, let's learn together. Let's let's ride in this canoe together. Let's learn together. When you come down to a local ia, don't worry. You know, we're there to help guide. Yeah, we we know the local ia better than maybe you, 
but hey, let's learn with each other because I don't know everything when you go back into your local, which is called the, the classroom. I don't know what's going on over there. I don't know how to navigate that local, that pond, right? So we have to figure out ways to bridge, right? Uh, those that Manao together. And um, I, I, that's what I hear the most from teachers. You know, I didn't grow up this way. I don't know that I, re I respect the culture too much to even attempt to try to know that I can teach them anything about Hawaiian culture, you know, let alone the language, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But hey, at the end of the day, we're all learners. And I really believe that we got to constantly build bridges of understanding because at the end of the day, it is about serving the kids and not about, you know, whether we have this or that or this ethnicity or this background or this life experience, whatever. We're in this journey together to help these kids. Let's do that. Does that make sense? Definitely, mahalo. That hierarchical strategy that, you know, Anthony Burley and I kind of figured out because initially when we were going island to island, we were appealing to teachers, you know, that came across. So the, these are grassroots teachers that already, you know, wanted, you know, felt comfortable in the culture and wanted the curriculum because it was aligned to standards, right? And they didn't have to do that work. Um, but we realized that after they went back from the training to their school, they hit the wall because either their grade level teacher or their principal or maybe even their CADs you know, was not on the same page as them. And so they didn't have that flexibility to mix it up, you know, in the classroom. Some of them did, some of them didn't. So what Auntie Burley and I, you know, decided to do was to go visit all of the CASs and to go visit as many principals as we could to kind of share, you know, what we were trying to do so that if you think of this hierarchy, you have all of the top leaders, you know, sort of supporting the idea. And then you have the grassroots teachers, students and families coming up and meeting in the middle and making it, you know, an environment so that everybody feels mutually supported. That is the transformative change that needs to occur that, uh, you know, that we've seen. And we realized that out of the 15 CASAs, this is like 15 years ago, not all of them were ready for this. And maybe maybe five, five or six out of the 15 CASAs across the state were, were, were ready for this. I think it's a lot more now, a lot of it because of the Office of Hawaiian Education, now they can really focus, you know, on on that Native Hawaiian Indigenous practices and stuff. So I, I think that is a really, really good thing. So we're still not there yet, right? As you know, we not we haven't we haven't converted all of them, all of the fifteen cas. And you know, we're going to come up with a new, brand new superintendent soon, uh, and that person will probably have their own thoughts and ideas, and we need to. You know, hopefully, ha hopefully have discussions with that person to, because all of the research is there. This is, you know, we're not making this up. This it works, it works. Uh, it's just that people got to be willing to, to do it. Other questions. I'm scrolling. Um, Uncle Herb, sorry, this is Mickey. I just hi, want Mickey. Hi, hi everybody. Aloha. Um, I wanted to say just thank you so much. I don't know um how much everybody here knows, and I only know about half or maybe seventy five percent of you. But um, Uncle Herb was one of my first first employers. Um, we found <laughs> each other on the fish pond wall. Um, in I think two thousand or two thousand one. It was a really long time ago. Um, yeah. So oh, I I'm really excited that you know to hear the story because I've I've been there for a lot of it and also just the beautiful curricula that I was so honored and blessed to be a part of the creation process of um, not Kahia yeah. local because that was before me but with Aloha Aina and Aina Hanau and then Malama Koho Olave like all of those things have been beautiful and we just um, I just wanted to I put in the chat and we'll send some messages around to folks but. Um, during the summer, we have a, um, a workshop series where we'll be walking through the materials on Ulukau, um, like Aloha Aina and Malama Koho Olave and Kahea Loko. Um, 
and and really thinking about how might we bring those into our classrooms once again if if we are not yet um, and so just trying to support teachers in creating um, lesson articulations and um, projects that might align to those resources and and you know really enjoy them again because they're such treasures so I just wanted to bring that up and we'll send that information through Gail um, to everybody registered for those that are interested and you can actually it's the governor's fund and so you can get paid to be a part of it and to work on those lesson plans for yourself we can stipend teachers up to two thousand dollars to create your own units as long as you're willing to share it with others so just wanted to bring that up and mahalo uncle herb for bringing in uncle pono too um both of you have been such transformative guides and mentors in my life so and i know but you know he's sailing so yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks everybody and so i'm yeah, sorry I, I, I was talking to so sorry no i i i as i was preparing this presentation pono's you know, presence was definitely, you know, in my consciousness putting this together. So, um, and I also want to do a shout out for Mickey and Hei Jung, you know, from Education Incubator, because they're working in our schools on the Windward side as well. And they do this wonderful program that was, you know, um, rooted in um, Uncle Pono Shim's thinking called Foundations of Aloha. And it is an absolutely amazing program and uh, teachers and students and families can be part of it if they want to. So the Look Up Foundations of Aloha Education Incubator, wonderful, wonderful work. Thanks, Vicky, for sharing that. And Deepur, did you, did you have a, a na'o? Oh, you're muted, Auntie. Herb, th yep. thank you so much for your, your presentation. What I, what I observed in the telling of you telling your story was how property became Aina again. How it went from slave slavery to freedom. <laughs> you know, the restoration of what it truly is. This is what happened for the fish pond. And I suspect for a lot of us who have been on the journey with you. So I so appreciate the work that you and Tiberlian you know, the role of intellect and education in this whole process is not escaping me. You know, both of you are well-educated edu people. And so, you know, to do Aina work doesn't mean you exclude the other. Yeah. It's the collaboration of both. And in the telling of your story and the story of the fish pond, you can see both of them like the Izzy Abbott principle, being in relationship to each other. And I so thank you for that, for that wonderful example. That's it. Mahalo. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. The power of Pilina, um, working with Gail, you know, we, uh, we did a presentation earlier with, with teachers in the after school space that focused on the power of Pilina. Uh, you know, and it came out of, you know, the sort of the trauma informed, you know, philosophy and methodology. And, but we, we wanted to put a, you know, we wanted to uh, make sure that the cultural component was foundational to all of that as well. So uh, really phenomenal stuff. As I said, you know, this, this journey is, you know, about so many other people and so many other canoes have been launched, but it was truly, it, it truly, you know, it was a well, it was an unexpected journey, but it was um, very much welcome now that I look back on it. It wasn't easy, let me tell you. It was hard and it continues to be hard, but you know, nothing worth anything is, is not going to be hard. And so, um, but we've learned from that and we've uh, persevered through it and, you know, and hopefully, you know, it, we've been transformed with it. So now I'm at the point, you know, of in my life looking for succession. And that's why, you know, I, I want to do some of these storytelling opportunities to hopefully begin to identify people that want to continue to take up, you know, take up the mission uh, and the journey. Um, we're not getting younger. <clears throat> we're on the other side of the hill now. <laughs> so mahalo kia kua. Any any other any other questions, you guys?
<laughs> okay, that's all, folks. I guess we're almost we're at 30 on Gail. Yeah, it is. Thank you all so much for joining us. And Herb, thank you so much for inspiring all of us at so many different levels. Um, I, Herb and I have also um, been talking. We have an event that we'll be posting on our website. So on June 11th, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., we'll be gathering at Waikoloa Local Ia. So you'll see more information on our website soon, and we'll get that out to all of you, and hopefully you can all join us. Thank you again for joining us, everyone. Have a nice evening. Aloha. 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 Aloha.